so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mahalat Kaf, and thank you for joining us this evening to end the um, Black Horror Perspective Intervention Series for this in-person portion. Tonight, I'll be talking with Tanana Reedu, which you see on the screen there. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, as we gather here today on stolen land, the Dave Barber Winnipeg Cemetery is situated on Treaty 1 territory, home to the ancestral people of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples. These lands are the heartlands of the Métis people. We acknowledge that our water is stolen from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, and with acknowledging the stolen land that we are on, we should strive to make this not only lip service, but something we can all claim to practice. The ways that we can be more proactive with the way we interact with the land is simply giving it back, giving up resources, time, and energy to the to Indigenous folks. Um, as well as though we're acknowledging the land that this organization is situated on, it's important that wherever you're situated, is situated on is to look into the ways you can be active in your community. If that's through donating to mutual aid funds, GoFundMes, supporting land defenders, and keeping up to date with what's going on in your cities and towns. I hope you're able to sit and think about your position as a person on stolen land. And as well as just for some housekeeping things, uh, for the last like five minutes of the conversation will be a small bit of time for a Q&A. And as well as if you, if you hope to stick around for the next portion of this evening, we'll be screening a Night of the Living, of the Living Dead uh, with a pre-show with some films, short films by Ben Williams, Monica Shola Negra, and Mariama Diallo. But yeah, now to introduce Tanana Reedu. Tanana Reedu is an award-winning author who teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism Afrofutur at UCLA. She's executive producer on Shudder's groundbreaking documentary, Horror Noir, History of Black Horror. She and her husband collaborator, Stephen Barnes, wrote a small town for season two of the Twilight Zone on CBS All Access. A leading voice in Black selective fiction for more than 20 years, she has won an American Book Award, an NAACP Image Award, and a British Fantasy Award. Her writing has been included in the best year of anthologies. Her books include Ghost Summer Stories, My Soul to Keep, and The Good House. She and her late mother, civil rights activist Patricia Stevens Dew, co-authored Freedom uh, in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir for the fight of civil rights. She is married to author Stephen Barnes, with whom she collaborates on screenplays. They live with their son, Jason, and two cats. So hi, Tanana Reed. Hey, how are you? Pretty good, pretty excited to be with you. I'm a huge fan of your work. And Oh, thank you. Yeah. My headphones on so I can hear better. Yeah, I hear sure. you, but it'll be even better with the headphones. Just one second. Yeah, for sure. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, so yeah, kind of knowing about your work, I'm really curious to know what your first introduction to horror films was and what made you interested in them. So I feel like you have a really good grasp in terms of what black horror is and the genre itself. Well, that is a good question. Uh, thank you for inviting me, by the way. Uh, sorry, I look like Princess Leia with these headphones on. Um, <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, um, <laughs> So I got it honestly, as we say, because actually like a lot of women I know, Black women, um, Black men too in particular, really a lot of horror fans I know, period. We got our love of horror from members of our family, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandmothers sometimes. So in my case, it was my mother. Uh, my mother, uh, her name was Patricia Stevens Dew. And as a matter of fact, it's, this is kind of dramatic, but I can actually put up a background because you can, act, I have her as a, one of my background settings, which I think is actually relevant to what I'm talking about here, because this is my mother being arrested in 1963 at a civil rights demonstration for the, oh, you know, wow. They just wanted to be able to go to a desegregated movie theater is I think what this particular arrest was about. Although she was arrested for many things. And the reason I like to bring it up when I'm talking about horror in particular is I don't think it's a coincidence that she was the first horror lover in my life. I used to think it was kind of weird actually that such a respected civil rights activist, she's in the Florida Civil Rights Hall of Fame in college, she was in my textbooks. I used to think it was a little weird that she was a horror fan in addition to being so celebrated and, and respected as a civil rights activist. But now that I'm older, although I never really got to discuss this with her, I have just decided that it was because of her civil rights activism that my mother was such a horror fan. Uh, so from a very young age, she was watching The Mummy, Wolfman, Dracula, all those old school, universal black and white horror movies. And I basically had no choice but to become a horror fan. And she also gave me my first Stephen King novel, The Shining, when I was 16. So I have to give my mom credit for that. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I love the photo you put in the background. It just kind of shows the type of person she was. And like, unfortunately, she was arrested for standing up for herself. But at the same time, you've mentioned too, just like that, li like your lineage has kind of talked about horror. And even though it's come to you in like later in life, you kind of have that appreciation now, right? And if you don't realize when you're young, like, oh, why is my mom watching all these scary movies? I don't get it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think, you know, this isn't true of every horror fan, but I think uh, a higher than expected percentage of people who self-identify as horror lovers or horror fans are coming from some kind of trauma experience. I mean, we all do experience small traumas. You know, there's nobody who gets through life unscathed. But I think when you get to sort of more major traumas, like the kind of history my family had, um, unwelcome in neighborhoods, uh, when we moved into neighborhoods, threats from neighbors, uh, this feeling of unease, you're not safe in your own space, uh, or people who grew up in abusive homes, which I did not, uh, luckily, but I think a lot of a lot of us gravitate around horror as a way to, to leach out trauma. Okay. It's like learning from that trauma and being able to put it out in other ways, right? And like more creative. Exactly. Ways. And a creative way that doesn't have the power to touch or hurt you. Because so far, at least, zombies aren't real. Yeah. As we know. Oh. Sorry. As far as we know. <laughs> um, kind of speaking to the next question I have for you, and maybe this is mostly touching on like your experience with horror, but in the documentary Horror Noir, which everyone should watch if they haven't seen it, it's really amazing. Um, it takes the audience on this journey to the history of uh, horror films made by Black people or about Black people. And why do you think it was so necessary to have like this arch of like black directors making black films, but also other folks making films about black people as well? Wow, this is a whole lecture unto itself. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, tell us. <laughs> I literally just gave an entire uh, Black History Month talk to a horror production company where I talked about why black horror is important, you know, and uh, some people might say, well, we're only 12% of the population in the United States and, and been down in the US anyway. And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of us will watch horror even if we're not in it. So mm -hmm. what's in it for them? <laughs> <laughs> and I was making the point, you know, that through the specific is how you get to the universal. And one thing that is very true about horror lovers is that we love novelty. There is really no higher compliment I can pay to a horror movie or even just a moment in a horror movie, except by saying, oh, I've never seen that before. Oh, I've never seen that done that way before. And, you know, of course, horror does rely on a lot of tropes, the haunted house. I will watch that movie every time. A family moves to an old house in the woods and something weird is, hello? I will watch that movie every time, but you have to give me a good reason and a different reason every time that there's a haunting. It can't be like the same old retread, something I've seen before. So where that leads to black horror, I mean, well, Get Out demonstrated by Jordan Peele. I'll just start with that. Demonstrated how powerfully black creators can weave stories that present as horror, but in some cases, not every black black horror creator wants to do this but in some cases you're actually no. talking about something else you're talking about a different kind of trauma right so in, in get out it's the trauma of white supremacy not knowing if you can trust the people around you or if you're a white viewer not knowing if if white people will be fully trusted because of the kinds of microaggressions and 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 the uh, pitfalls of allyship you know saying the wrong thing like oh i would have voted for Obama for a third, oh, do I have to say that? that why did I even say that, <laughs> you know? Um, so there's that, it just, and it made $250 million. So it wasn't just popular with black people. It was popular worldwide. And it's just a new prism through which to examine life. And horror, like all art, is just providing a prism through which to view life. And any creator's experience, whether they're black or, indigenous or queer, any creator's experience that is bringing their history, their sensibilities, even if it's not get out and in your face where racism is the monster, it's going to be different. It's going to be novel. It's going to expand our understanding of the world we're living in in some way. And since we're only here for a finite time, why not get to learn about different corners of it? 
right? And so one trend that I'm a little uh, uneasy about that I see coming in Hollywood is where they'll take a script that was not written for Black actors and cast either the lead Black or maybe several characters Black. And sometimes that works great, like George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, classic example of a movie that already had sort of social commentary as an underpinning. And then you add a Black lead and it just leaps out even more. Okay, great success. Same with The Girl with All the Gifts, which is also a zombie movie, but more recent where there's a biracial lead. And again, it was already coming with a sort of a social point of view. So in making that lead a little Black girl, in the movie opens when she's in prison orange just just like whoa my statements about society are just that much more elevated now because i've i've changed the race so those are success stories and then and then there are some that are not success stories and like i take i am also i'm also a screenwriter and as i like to say i'm trying to work in this town so i don't i don't often uh try to pick on individual projects but in your imagination, you might be able to think of a film uh, that was cast with a Black lead and where that casting lead. Oh, Candyman's a great example. I'll use Candyman because I've written about this a lot. There are a lot more recent examples, but Candyman is the safest one for me to talk about. Um, that story by Clive Barker was not written to, to take place in a Black housing project. Candyman was not Black. There was no mention of race, whatever, in the original short story. So when the filmmakers in the 1990s decided to adapt it to film and set it in the U.S., uh, well, when you think of housing project in the U.S., now it's Black housing project, and they chose Cabrini Green, which is famous. It was a famous Black housing project. And then they made the monster Black with sort of this backstory of, of racial violence against him to create his monstrosity. And from what I understand, Tony Todd actually contributed to adding that backstory. That wasn't even something I, I think that was in the original concept. So there had not been a lot of thought to how adding race to Candyman would have an impact on the film. And although I love Candyman, it's also a very problematic film because of the addition of race. It doesn't age well. You know, if you're really looking for it, you can find some things that don't age well about it because it's not written from a Black sensibility, which is what Nia DaCosta did in the reboot of Candyman, is instead of talking about Black trauma through a white lens, you're mm -hmm. talking about Black trauma through a Black lens. And while I'm glad for actors who can get work through colorblind casting and you know this kind of thing, I think studios and networks and streamers need to be much more mindful about hiring consultants to make sure they're not creating problems by changing the race of a character in a film that isn't meant to address race in any way. Race doesn't exist in a colorblind film very often. So, and I would also caution people not to rely on casting as a way of creating black horror because the best people to create black horror are black creators. You know, it's not that other people can't, but it's just like, well, why would you want to close the doors to a black creator who wants to tell a, a black horror story with a black lead while making room for a white creator who wants to create horror with a black lead. It's just more status quo with a different face, whereas Hollywood needs to be more open. It needs to open its doors. It needs to, to give us more voices so we can see who's the next Jordan Peele. Mm -hmm. I think you brought up a lot of amazing points and things that I think a lot of folks are thinking about in terms of casting. What does it mean to actually have like a black director or even thinking about like stories that are written for us by us right and it just makes the stories more authentic so like for example you mentioned kenny man like the original one it just it had a lot of like white saverism like element to it right at the time it seemed it was an amazing film but now it's like oh it's aged terribly <laughs> for like all the things right but it almost it exists for there for a reason so people can understand like we have to make films for us because if they do it won't come out the way we want it to right no, it's not like the, a lot of the black characters in the original Candyman are more props than actual characters. Like there's a little boy randomly leading Helen around the housing project. We don't know who he is, where his parents, no he's name. with her all day. <laughs> who is he? <laughs> we only, there's a mother who's upset, you know, because her dog got killed. I understand she's upset, but she's almost just there to, to be in grief and to wail and to be sad. And yeah. she's not really a, a character per se. Um, and then Bernadette, who was kind of a character played by Casey Lemons, the black friend, who definitely had to be there because without the black friend, it really looks bad. Yeah. But, but then the way they used her 
was to say things that the white lead couldn't say, right? Like they get to Gabrini Green, it's like, ooh, it smells like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, you're black and everything. <laughs> she disappears your privilege is showing no she doesn't just disappear she gets murdered by candy man and she gets murdered by the way and she didn't even say it five times it was helen who said it the fifth time she just happened to be standing there so i would call her uh there's a trope that we talk about in horror noir like these kinds of roles that that white creators have put black actors in the kind of boxes Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't, she isn't quite this, but she borderline is a sacrificial Negro. The sacrificial Negro is the the black character who sacrifices him or herself so that the white character may live and thrive. She isn't exactly that because she didn't volunteer. She didn't know Candyman was going to show up, but the senselessness and needlessness of her death, especially given that it goes against the actual mythology of the story, makes it feel like she's a sacrifice. So that, oh, now we're really scared because something might happen to the character we actually care about. Right. Yeah, kind of speaking to what you mentioned before, I kind of want to take the conversation to a different way in in terms of like, although this documentary is a lot for noir, which which we've talked about, uh, all the films mentioned the film have been around for a very long time, but there still is like this erasure of in terms of like uh, the black narrative in mainstream horror. And why do you think that erasure exists? Which I think is a (laughs) bit. Wow. 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 Because in my way, um, black people should be dominating black horror, right? In terms of just, you know, trauma, but on top of trauma, of like storytelling and all those other things, right? But, did y'all bring dinner? Because this is a long... <laughs> <laughs> this is the last uh, question. Why? <laughs> um, you know, the simplest way to put it is that Hollywood is a very close and rarefied and privileged space, even today. Like, I mean, there are a lot of internships where you don't even get paid. So who can afford to take six weeks off in the summer to work for free. Well, often not marginalized people, not black and brown people, you know. Um, So let's just start with that and extrapolate out to people like to hire their friends and think of how isolated some people's friend circles are. Uh, That's why there are a lot of stereotypes that I saw coming out of Hollywood films. Like I grew up in Miami, which had, it's a majority minority city, right? A very high uh, Latinx uh, population, majority really Cuban, Puerto Rican. So my stereotype for Hispanics, as they call themselves, was your boss. That's my stereotype. Mm -hmm. I never saw that stereotype in Hollywood. The stereotype I saw out of Hollywood was the gardener. Mm -hmm. And this is reflecting the lack of a friend circle (laughs) for people who are writing these. They don't know anybody who's brown from work in a friend circle who isn't a gardener right? Or if they do, they didn't bother to write that part or cast that part that way. And what you end up with is just the most stereotypical roles possible. The gangster, Mm -hmm. the gardener, the sassy friend, like all these cliches that they've seen over and over and over again that make it into their new scripts. So they get reheated and reserved and we're watching these same stereotypes, right? So extrapolate this back to the birth of Hollywood. 1915, The Birth of a Nation is the first Hollywood blockbuster. It's not the first movie, but it's the first of this length. It's the first with close-ups and these kind of angles. It was the, it was the first modern film. And it was very popular for generation, like until the 30s, it was like the top movie. So this was like everywhere. Everyone's watching this. And, and if you have to sit through birth of a nation and maybe i can help prevent you having to sit through it the whole point is the glorification of white supremacy the whole point is to negate the gains that were made during reconstruction and to mischaracterize black politicians who were elected during reconstruction to present black people as either the faithful servants who were the good black people that is what the sacrificial negro morphed into we're not servants but we're serving, <laughs> you know what I mean? We get, right? Yeah. Um, and or or the bad ones, the monsters uh, who were in blackface, by the way, because you couldn't have black actors touching white people and, and uh, you know, especially white women. Woo. Um, whole towns got lent, burned down over that or just the accusation of that in the in the in the United States. So so you have the bad ones uh, chasing the white women and, and there are key emotional turning points in Birth of a Nation that are all about how fearful Black masculinity is in its pursuit of white 
womanhood, which by the way, in psychology is a term called projection, because if you look at all of the different complexions of black people at that time in the United States, they were not produced from loving relationships between black and white people. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, African-Americans, whether it was one generation ago, two generations ago, six generations ago, were the product of rape because rape was commodified during slavery. White men could have any black woman they wanted, even if they weren't in slavery. There wasn't even a conviction of rape of a white man uh, who was accused by a black woman until maybe then, I think the 1950s. So free reign, you know, when people have free reign, they're going to behave freely, some people. Yeah. And that projection created kind of this obsessive fear that black men wanted to rape white women. And this is what led to uh, the Tulsa massacre. <laughs> this is what led to the Rosewood massacre, all these accusations. Uh, Emmett Till, don't get me started. So why, I'm sorry, your original question was why these stories have been shut, at, shut out. It's very, very hard even today to gain entry into Hollywood. It's very, very hard to get a green light for a project as a black storyteller. And, and part of that reason is that there just aren't enough people who are marginalized, who are in those decision-making positions, who recognize that story is like, oh, that would be great. Yeah. Oh, I can relate to that. Like, oh, I think that could sell great. And, and it's, it's, I mean, like I said, it's a long answer. Exclusion is the short answer. And, and one, just one example I'll give so people understand what exclusion looks like. Uh, after the 1970s, which was kind of a rarefied time when you did get films that were for black people like they would intend to show them in black neighborhoods and black movie theaters there was no thought that people had to like it in Kansas or in China or anywhere else except in black neighborhoods so you had like Blackula William Crane directed that you had Shaft you had you know and they're not all great movies and and in fact, maybe none of them are great movies, but but um, in black exploitation. But you had these opportunities where people could get experience as actors, experience as crew people, experience you know, and and then that went away. And what people would tell you was, well, that idea wouldn't work because it won't work in the foreign markets. And very often, when people are talking about foreign markets, they're literally talking about China, right? This is so. So my question is, if that's such a consideration. If we're so concerned about foreign markets, why don't we have more Chinese American leads? Mm. There's not, see what I mean? It's like, so it's, <laughs> it's a complete deflection. Yeah. In fact, I defy you to think of a time that a Chinese American male has had a kiss or a romantic scene in, a, in an American movie. Mm. Keep thinking. Can't think of any. <laughs> okay, so they would use the excuse that your black story won't sell in China, <laughs> while at the same time having no thought at all of actually including more Asian actors in these movies, right? So it's it's it was all deflection, and it's all about centering whiteness. Not everybody who does it is a raving racist, but it's just what has happened, and it's how it began. And it's still to a lot of Hollywood executives like they're like, oh, when will things get back to normal? Meaning like, when do we have to stop? taking all these meetings with all these marginalized people whose stories we're not going to tell. And a few people are getting through. That's the great part. Right. In this era, post Get Out, post Black Panther, post George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter uh, summer of reckoning, a lot more people are getting opportunities, um, a lot more. But it's still a very closed system that's hard to break into, and it always has been. I think you're speaking to a lot of different things in terms of like having to push, having for marginalized folks have to push those barriers, but at the same time, it's hard to get double-edged sword because there is this like upholding of whiteness in film and like specific genres like horror, so it makes it harder, but at yes. the same time, I think it, I think it does also push folks, unfortunately, to like go harder to like, you make their opportunities seen and like, what's for folks like Jordan Peele or even like I'm thinking about Maria Medallo or like thinking about the new film um it's came out Regina Hall I think it's okay. yes master yeah, master you know like there are things coming out and I think that's amazing to see and it's it's hard but it's it's happening slowly as yeah, I, I heard her so. name I guess you're going to be showing one of her shorts is it hair yes. yes yes <laughs> yeah, I, I love that movie. And also, I just did a Q&A with her at UCLA, and she will be the first person to say, Jordan Peele opened that door. You right. know, just like I got my first screen credit, Twilight Zone, 
yeah. Jordan Peele literally opened that door because he hired me to do it. <laughs> but <laughs> Jordan Peele has just opened doors for people he's never met, never known. Horror Noir got the green light. The documentary got the green light the day he won his Oscar. It was like, oh, Black Horror. Uh-huh. I can see what you're saying now. Black, yes. Okay, Black <laughs> Horror. <laughs> um, but yeah, that it's he's been hugely influential. Right. Kind of thinking about like black horror aesthetics, I was thinking and like thinking of the last maybe 30 years or 40 years, do you feel like they shifted the like aesthetics in terms of what we're seeing in different like subject matters? I think you've mentioned before, you know, there is like this heavy um, focus on race, but there is like other ways that black folks can show horror, right? Absolutely. And should, you know, I, I would no more want to burden any creative with the idea that they have to make movies where white supremacy is the monster, then I would want to tell Black creators don't make movies where Black su white supremacy is the monster. You know, as creators, you have to tell the story that's in your heart. And maybe now could be the most eclectic time. Yeah, you know, it really could. When you look at Master, when you look at Nanny, when you look at Sweetheart by J.D. Dillard, uh, sweetheart is just, you know, a biracial woman is on an island and there's a monster. It's a monster movie. It has nothing to do with race, but it addresses, like you said, it's not erasing Black people. It's like, it's a story that centers a Black woman that isn't about race. We get to just exist and get chased mon by monsters like anybody else, you know? <laughs> Yay no, for us. <laughs> um, the 70s, there was more of a type of movie, you know, you you can pretty much tell when you're walk, watching a black exploitation movie from the costumes, from the way people talk. It's just very self-consciously uh, hip and you know stylish and 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 over stylish, really with the big pimp hats and all this. Not really that uh, flattering a portrait, some of them. But then you did have a movie like Ganja and Hess, which was also in the 70s, and, and that studio wanted to, to benefit from the black exploitation era. But you know, the director, William Gunn, was like, mm, no, I'm gonna make a, my own kind of movie, and it's a more arty movie. Now I think, it, but that's a standout. Like I can't even think of another movie remotely like that uh, from that era. I may just be missing something. The 90s, you started to see more uh, variety because that's when I started publishing. Uh, and there were, you know, that was the era of, even though it's not black horror, blacks in horror, as Dr. Robin Armin's Coleman would call Candyman. Uh, but that was the era of Candyman, Eve's Bayou, which is Casey Lemons. Um, I'll count 1989's Death by Temptation because it was leading into the 90s. And Tales from the Hood, Retribution Horror, right? So Eve's Bayou and Tales from the Hood are two very different movies. Right. Um, one is about the monster in the house, and the other is very often about the monstrosity outside. Uh, a lot of racism and, and dealing with racism, um, uh, gang violence, things like that. Now, I think is probably the most eclectic time. And part of the reason for that is because it's never been cheaper to make a movie. Not that it's cheap, but since you can literally shoot a movie on your iPhone, it's never been cheaper to make one, and it's never been cheaper to put it up on YouTube so anybody can see it. You're not gonna make a lot of money that way necessarily, but you can't say that there's no way for you to get your movie up for other people to see. It's, it's okay. never been easier to do that. So because of that, you're gonna see all kinds of like, Hair Wolf is like, wow, that's just very different. Right. I think you're speaking to like this accessibility now where it's like back then it's, it was harder to show someone your film, you to show a friend or like give them like a disc or something or like a VHS maybe, but now it's like you can post on like Instagram, you can post on YouTube, like you have so many more options and I feel like potentially a larger audience, right? From across the world, not only just people in your community, but everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Yes. Um, I, would, I wanted to mention about this, but I think you teach this really amazing course at UCLA called uh, Sunken Place, Race and Survival of Black Forest Aesthetic, which I would love to take one day because that would be such a fun course to discuss. It is um, pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> you for yourself, like, I enjoy this so much. Uh, can you talk a bit about the class and what can tell you to not, I guess, in terms of like, you study horror, but now you also teach it. So, yeah. Yeah, I was teaching Afrofuturism at UCLA and Afrofuturism is just the black speculative arts is, is the easiest way to explain that a science fiction fantasy and horror and it's a much broader course. But when Get Out came out, I was like, holy cow, I have an opportunity to use this film as a linchpin to discuss the history of black cinema. Uh, black horror cinema rather, um, starting with The Birth of a Nation, which isn't technically considered a horror movie and it's not black certainly, but it's a horror movie to black people. 
and it's a perfect ex examination of how black monstrosity was driving uh, like a lot of the voodoo uh, obsession and early cinema, you know, and all that black magic and like they're going to turn and, and back when zombies were shamblers, they were just like mindless slavery uh, metaphors uh, before Romero turned them into uh, flesh eating monsters. But all that was fear of blackness, fear of black power. Um, so I start at the beginning, W.E.B. Du Bois, the American uh, scholar civil rights act advocate, anti-lynching advocate. Most people know him just as an SAS, one of the co-founders of the NAACP. He also wrote science fiction and horror. There's a story he wrote called The Comet that was published in 1920. New York City is pretty much wiped out by a comet. The only survivors are a black man and a white woman. So this is again, repeating the imagery from, uh, or really foreshadowing the imagery from Jordan Peele's Get Out because that black male white female pairing is so explosive in American history. But what Peel does is turn it on its head. And I talk about like a lot of these films that we've discussed and also short stories I wanna point out because I don't wanna leave out the, the writers. <laughs> you know, a lot of black horror has been focused on original screenplays and some of them are fantastic, but I can't help but notice how few Black books uh, and short stories have been adapted to film or television. So there's a real big disconnect, especially when you consider that overall about 50% of, of movies are supposed to be adaptations, you know? So why is that not happening with black literature? That's a very good question. After more years than I want to discuss, I finally had my first short story adaptation on Shudder's Horror Noir, you know, which is is the follow-up to the documentary, six short black uh, horror stories by different writers, including me, my, my husband, Stephen Barnes, and I wrote two. But one is another student that I, or rather another uh, writer that I teach in my UCLA class named Stephanie Malia Morris. She wrote a story called Bride Before You, which is very creepy historical creature horror. And she got her first adaptation pretty much right out the gate. So I'm very happy for her. I'm sad I had to wait so long, but I was very grateful to be a part of a project that was a community effort. And that's kind of what my, my syllabus is. It's like a, an overview of Black horror, whether it's written or, or cinema or television. We added Lovecraft Country. Um, and I should point out that for people who were listening and think, oh, that course sounds fun. I do have an online version that I co-taught with my husband, Stephen Barnes, and I would say probably just a couple months, maybe even just a month before he won his Oscar, Jordan Peele came and Skyped, this was pre-Zoom uh, for us, he Skyped in to do a talk that is a part of the class, and that's at www.sunkenplaceclass.com. Amazing. Um, I think something you mentioned before about like the combination between watching those, those like stories as well because it does go hand in hand you can't only just teach a class about black horror but they also having to include those writers as well but yes. I think, you know and i think that as well you mentioned before about jordan peele opening doors i think i see you as well opening doors for people and like giving people a chance to like believe in themselves like i can make an adaptation of my film or of my story right so i think you're doing an amazing job doing that as well <laughs> well i appreciate that and i know when i first started publishing horror back in 1995 i certainly did not know of any other black horror writers i mean there were a couple i just had not met them yet but it took me a long time to find my way to writing horror with black protagonists when i say a long time it's like college grad school i was still writing white characters I wasn't even writing genre, <laughs> okay? I was lost. I was lost because as a little girl, I had started writing Black characters and speculative fiction. But the more I was exposed to canon, uh, you know, and writers I love, Hemingway and Faulkner and, you know, all the writers I love. But at the same time, I was erased in those stories. And, and the, my question of what a story felt like, what constitutes a story, what is literature, was very much influenced by that exposure or rather lack of exposure to, for example, Octavia Butler, I didn't even know about until I was midway through writing my second novel. And I think if I had discovered her in high school, I would have skipped several phases <laughs> of, of, of writing that was not coming from my deepest well of creativity, you know, and really discovered a lot sooner what I wanted to actually write about. I'm gonna ask about two more questions and we'll take a question from the audience technically because someone sent me a question in advance we couldn't make it in person but okay. uh, and then we'll have one more question from the audience and then we'll close out the talk 
But I wanted to ask, um, where do you see films by Black people with horror themes going in the future? And what do you hope to see in the next, I would say, 10 years, maybe? In the next 10 years, I would like to see a lot more Black screenwriters and directors having opportunities to tell their stories. I would like to see a move away from the idea that lynching is what constitutes horror, uh, because that's what gives birth to that term trauma porn. And I think that that is an immature approach to horror uh, overall. I mean, frankly, those aren't my favorite kind of movies, even if there was no racial element. Uh, just, you know, I, I'm not... Anyway, nothing against slashers or anything like that. Slashers are fun. But my favorite horror stories are not about unredemptive death or even redemptive suffering, <laughs> you know, if it's racialized and I have to be sitting there in a front row seat at what basically constitutes a lyn lynching because there's too much of that in our history. That's not entertaining. I think horror first and foremost has the obligation to be entertaining. And if you're not being entertainment, then, then what are we doing even, right? So there's the entertainment. And then on top of that, just the freedom to express dread, body horror, all the things, the, the, the lost in the woods. I want to see that story with Black characters. I want to see the, the wintry mountain cabin story with Black characters. I want to see stories I haven't even thought about with Black characters that are not just sort of uh, Black versions of white horror stories we've seen many times, but at the same time, every horror movie is a version of a story we've seen many times for the most part. What makes it different is that very specific sensibility that it's coming from, like uh, La Riona, which was on Shudder, um, the good one, is about genocide, but it manifests as a ghost story, right? Um, his house uh, on Netflix that. It's a, is it's about... A yeah, immigration narrative horror, but presents as a haunted apartment story, you know, and, and, really? and I really, and, and there's one called Blood Quantum, uh, indigenous yeah. horror, that is a zombie story where the reservation is the safe place, and it's the white people trying to get in, and, and every single version of, of, a, of a horror trope told from a, a marginalized point of view, where the filmmakers have taken care and thought, and, 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 they're just incredible. And as a horror fan, I just want to see more of all those things. You know, I, I want all of us to have our stories told. I'm not trying to exclude anybody. I'm just trying to be included. Right. There's so many different possibilities to like explore, right? There's so many parts of people's identities other than the trauma that comes with it. And those parts are important, but I, as you mentioned before, those have been done already. And I think that there's so much more out there to talk about. Yeah, I think the new Candyman did a really extraordinary job of minimizing actual on-screen violence to Black people right. while still expressing that really generational trauma, sometimes through just storytelling, but also through that little animation and the puppetry. Like, it's like, we're, we're going to take a soft approach to this. This is hard stuff. Nobody wants to see this man's hand getting cut off by a bunch of racists, right? Um, that's triggering me. That's reminding me of Trayvon Martin. That's reminding me of that last shooting I just heard about that happened last week or whatever it is, or the one I'm afraid of. I have an 18 year old son, you know, so I'm popped out of the entertainment when it becomes too close to, to the real life trauma. So instead, Nia DaCosta took body horror and fear of loss of self and made that the centerpiece of the horror or that your, your partner is having a nervous breakdown, that how scary would that be? So do you make that the center of the horror? And the lynching and the, the racialized trauma is muted in the background. Right. Um, now kind of moving into, so enough of my question, there's some folks that we will ask a question for the audience. So if anyone has a question, please put their hand up. I'm gonna ask a, first a question that someone sent me a couple hours ago. Uh, so this person named Zach wants to know uh, for you, have you ever tackled for um, about white people that use the element of Haitian voodoo or like the misrepresentation of voodoo? Have you ever tackled it in your own writing? Yeah, it's a tough, that's a tough one. You know, when I wrote my first novel, The Between, which is basically about alternate realities, it has nothing to do with any system of faith or anything at all. But there was a reader uh, I admired from the Caribbean who was kind of like, hmm, I wish you had done your research. And, I, and that hurt. I was like, what you talk? But, you know, after a few years, I did do more research. And I came up with a, a, a novel called The Good House, which does use elements of voodoo. But at the same time, I really tried hard 
to characterize voodoo as a faith and it just and it, it and it was used for good you know but also uh the misuse of power which is a, something that comes up a lot when people have power whether it's through voodoo or whatever kind of power you have these cautionary tales uh, don't miss you know don't misuse your power don't abuse your power but she abused her power and opened the door to a demon and so voodoo is not you know the demon itself isn't voodoo but it was the doorway uh, for the demon to walk through and I, the highest compliment i've received is from people who are practitioners of african-based religions like santeria and voodoo who say oh i thought you were a practitioner too mm -hmm. so that's the highest compliment to me is that i i did my research i'm not saying it's perfect uh, i'm not saying that sometimes i don't feel like it's appropriation because that isn't my background and, and maybe 10 years from now, I'll feel like that's not my story to tell, you know, but I did absolutely as an ally do my best. And there has been so much mischaracterization. In fact, that when we were developing that for film back in 2008 and Forrest Whitaker wanted to direct it, we were in a meeting and he said, yeah, we're not going to use the voodoo. Uh, we're going to make it some other magic because it had been so misused in Hollywood. He just didn't want to be another in a line of movies like Serpent in the Rainbow. I'm sorry to say I love Wes Craven, but that one is a misstep in terms of its its use of black people as props and voodoo, voodoo itself as a kind of monstrosity. Right. Yeah, because thinking about it can be done really well if you do, the, do your homework, as you mentioned before, right? But specifically, it's coming from like a Black person that's interested in this other um, ways of living or ways of practicing, right? And the fact that someone gives you the compliment, it's like, oh, that's really nice. Like, thank you. <laughs> you know, just, just uh, you have to have a, if not a wide circle of friends, then at least a wide circle of people you can go to and say, hey, would you read this? Uh, even if it's just an outline form, okay. 10 pages, what do you think of this? And, and you know, you'd be surprised at how quickly you can fix something problematic at an early stage. Just what I told this production company, don't wait till you shot it, like do it at the script stage. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was the one question from before. If so any folks have any questions, we have, we have room for like one more because Tanana, Tanana Reef has to go to another event after. I know. It's okay. I did back to back today somehow. No problem. So yeah, any questions from the audience? Comments? Thoughts? Oh, sorry to bother you. Her thoughts on sorry to bother you? Yeah, because I like Yeah, for sure. Uh the audience is wanting your thoughts on sorry to bother you. Sorry to bother you is a fantastic film. Um, I teach it in my Afrofuturism class, not as horror, but more as surrealism. Although frankly, it can be whatever it's in the eye of the beholder. So there are aspects of that movie that absolutely feel like horror. The whole idea of the uh the uh what do you call those horses? <laughs> <laughs> those human horses uh ah i can't remember uh what what the term is that that boots riley uh called them but the idea that you could be turned into a horse creature working yourself for the corporate uh for corporate wealth and be recruited to be the martin luther king of horse people is a very <laughs> scary idea <laughs> So, holy cow that really is almost like a horror movie looking at uh capitalism and and you know living and having to live where you work and all this kind of thing but most people don't consider it horror most people would consider it like surrealism i guess okay. all right if anyone else has any oh sorry david has a question and that also the question was from ben who's in the audience but david go ahead uh, i'm just wondering if you can name some of your favorite black horror films that might surprise us did you hear that? Should I repeat it? Yeah, it's name some of my favorite Black horror films. Would it, that would surprise you that they're my favorites or that would surprise you just because you didn't know about them? I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> favorite Black, wow. Okay. Well, I've named some of them. Uh, Eve's Bayou is difficult. Uh, I know in the 90s when I saw it, I only wanted to see it once. <laughs> But over time, I've come to really appreciate what an outlier it was and how far ahead of its time and how well made it is. So that one is kind of surprising to me now, uh, all these years later, that I can name that as one of my favorites. When at the time I was a little mad at the movie because I didn't like the character and I didn't like, you know, what I thought he did, but because it's difficult. But, the, but that is one of my favorites. Um, 
Blackula, I just rewatched that. You know what? Not bad. It's not perfect. Uh, it has what it, it feels like some homophobia in there, which I can't tell if that's coming from the characters or from the filmmaker. It's hard to tell sometimes where it's coming from, but it really is trying to do something. It's trying to accomplish something within this, this narrow sort of vampire story, like do it with away with slavery and, uh, you know, the, uh, the Afrocentrism and throwing cops around at the end and all that. It, it really was trying to do something. So that's a good one. Let me think favorite horror movies that might black horror movies that might surprise you. You know, I, you, that I love so many of them. It's really, really hard to say. I don't think any of them would be surprising because they're awesome. Uh, Get Out, of course, His House. A lot of the ones I mentioned are my favorites. And then there are these short films. Like if you can find movies like Harewolf, Suicide by Sunlight, which is a short film, Nikki Atujusu, who did Nanny. That was her other Sundance short. So in fact, it's free online, Suicide by Sunlight. I'll call that my surprise. Because before Get Out, when I was teaching Afrofuturism, short films were all I had. There was no Black Panther. <laughs> there was no Get Out. So if I wanted to teach contemporary Black science fiction, contemporary Black horror, I had to go to short films. Uh, there's a film called Wake by Bree Newsom, who took the Confederate flag down from the South Carolina State House after the massacre in Charleston. She's also, she's my surprise, she's also a filmmaker before she became a full-time activist. And her short film, Wake, which again is a cautionary tale about what can go wrong when you conjure, is really one of my favorites and not many people even know it exists. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for this evening, but thanks everyone for the question. Thank you so much to Nana Reeve for- Oh, thank you. Thank you for here. these questions. I don't know how many people are in this audience or what's going on there. Like a strong 15. Yeah, that's good. Getting out of the house, that's more than I do. Um, <laughs> And, but thank you for inviting me. This has been great fun. And, you know, if anyone's curious, definitely check out uh, the Sunken Place class online. It, it's a week, it's a, I think what is it, a five or six week course, but you take it at your own pace. There, you know, there, there's no grading. It's just lectures, readings, films, and that interview with Jordan Peele. And even if you've seen Jordan Peele a million times, every time I hear him in an interview, he says something new and brilliant. So it's worth checking out. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on our Thank a good you. Rest. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>